So this is the video for section 2.2 on sample spaces in events. So by the time you're watching this video, you'll have already read subsection 2.1, where we talked about what our interpretation of probability was going to be. In particular, you'll have read about how we're going to be doing mathematical probability. That is, we are going to set up our framework very formally and precisely using mathematical definitions. And so this subsection is the first step towards that. So if we want to define properly and mathematically what the probability of an event is, we in fact need to start by saying, what's an event? So in this subsection, we're going to look at proper formal mathematical definitions of what events are. And we're going to be doing that using the language of set there. So our setup will go something like this. The most important thing we start with is what is called a sample space. A sample space is normally given this letter, which is the capital Greek letter omega. So a sample space is normally given capital omega. And the sample space, what this represents, is all the possible outcomes from what we're looking at. This is All possible, even the incredibly unlikely outcomes. So anything that could possibly happen is in this sample space, which is a set called omega. And so things that are inside this set are the possible outcomes themselves. And we normally call those sample outcomes. So sample outcome. And we normally give that this letter, which is, it looks a little bit like a W, but it's kind of loopier. And this is a lowercase omega. So the sample space is a capital omega, which kind of looks like that thing. And the sample outcome is the little loopy W, which is a little omega. And uh, a sample outcome is just like one particular possible outcome. So sample outcome is one possible outcome. We don't always use the little omega. There are lots and lots and lots of different letters that are useful for different things. And so finally, an event is some set of outcomes. So that means it's some of the sample space, maybe all of it, maybe none of it, maybe a little bit of it, maybe lots of it. Some outcomes which are making up some of the sample space. The mathematical word we use is it's a subset of the sample space. Because the sample space is a set and we're taking some set within that to be an event. We normally use letters for events like capital A, capital B and capital C, although again, in some circumstances, other letters are convenient. And we write this A kind of loopy thing, omega, to mean A is an event in omega, or A is a subset of omega. This is all very highfalutin and theoretical. What will be really helpful is when we look at some examples. I'm hoping the examples will make it clear what all this mathematics we're talking about. So let's do some examples. And some of these examples are things that we're going to come back to lots and lots during this course. First example, we're going to look at tossing a coin. Maybe a fair coin, maybe a biased coin, doesn't matter for the moment. And we're going to record when we toss the coin, does it land heads or tails? So what is our sample space, the space of all possible outcomes here? Well, the possible outcomes are it lands heads which we'll call H, or it lands tails, which we'll call T. And the way that you write something as being a set is that you put curly brackets around it and set apart the things with commas. So that means omega is the set that contains H, meaning uh, we toss a head on the coin, and T meaning we toss tails on the coin. And so let's give an example 
an event in that. So an event is a set consisting of some of the outputs. So for example, uh, if we toss the coin and we get a head, then that means the outcome we've seen is H, but of course it's a set, so we put curly brackets around H. So there's our first example, tossing a coin. Let's see another example we'll come back to. Many times, rolling a dice. So a dice has six sides. When we roll it, we could get a one, two, three, four, five, or six. So our sample space, omega here, will be surrounded by brackets and set off by commas. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the outcome, the sample outcome one means we rolled a one on the dice. The sample outcome two means we rolled a two on the dice, and so on. So again, we can look at some events within this sample space. So uh, roll an even number, for example. Well, the even numbers here are 2, 4, and 6, the set, so we surround it by curly brackets and put in some commas. So the event that we roll an even number is 2, 4, 6. The event that we roll at least 5, that would be another event. Well, the things that we could roll that are at least 5 are 5 or 6. So again, this is a 5 or 6 in curly brackets with a comma between them. That's another example. We're not stopping there, we have lots of examples to do. Here's another example. Uh, suppose I'm in charge of an insurance company and I want to count uh, how many people make claims at my insurance company in a year. So what's the sample space here? So annual claims at an insurance company. Well, we could get zero claims. It's extremely unlikely, but we have to include even the extremely unlikely things in our sample outcome. Anything that's even like logically possible has got to be in there. So it could be not. We could just get one claim, again, very unlikely. We could get two claims, very unlikely. But at least in theory, like any positive integer number of claims is possible. So our set here is all the positive integers, which is sometimes given this kind of double struct Z with a plus to mean positive integers. I guess I mean non-negative integers, since we can include zero as well. So again, what's an event within this sample space? Well, an event could be uh, the event that we get less than a thousand claims. So what elements of our sample space would satisfy this? Well, naught would and one would and two would and any of the integers less than a thousand would satisfy this event happening, right? So that would be the event naught, one, two, dot, 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 998, 999, stop, because it was less than a thousand. So obviously there's lots of different events within this sample space because this sample space is now very big. One more example, just to say that we've uh, really licked the plate clean here. Uh, let's suppose we've got a computer and we want it to give us a random number between 0 and 1. So, random number between 0 and 1. I mean, there's kind of some choice here about exactly how you model the computer works, but for the sake of my model, I'm going to say that omega is all the real numbers between 0 and 1. Those of you who've seen bracket notation for intervals before might know that square brackets means include the edge. So this is all real numbers that are between 0 and 1 inclusive. And so again, let's look at a few events that live inside this sample space. A random number, well, it might be bigger than a half, for example. Bigger than a half. 
So the sample outcomes that would satisfy that are all the real numbers that are bigger than a half, but still in this set of things between zero and one. That's half one. Uh, those of you who know this bracket notation will know that the curly bracket by the half means that the half isn't included and the square bracket over one means the one isn't included. Although you don't really need to know that for this class. Uh, what about some other events? Uh, what about first digit is a seven? So, you know, like 0.75 or 0.72 or 0.78787878787878 or whatever. So those are all the numbers that start at 0.7 and go up to 0.8, but non-inclusive, right? So that's 0.7 with a square bracket because it is included up to 0.8 with a round bracket because it isn't. Again, I don't need you to get too pet up about what the square brackets and round brackets mean. I'm just trying to get the idea of what these events are. I mean, another event could be that the number is exactly equal to something, say, 1 over square root 2. That's a number between 0 and 1. 0.7-ish, I think. Um, so that's the set that consists only of 1 over square root 2. So in our set notation, it's 1 over square root 2, but put it in curly brackets because it's a set. Okay, so we've done quite a lot of examples there, four examples. Uh, there is just one thing I want to draw your attention to, not because it's important now, but because it will be important later on in the course. Uh, when we tossed a coin, we only had two outcomes. So in particular, we had a finite number of outcomes there. When we rolled a dice, one to six, again, that was a, a finite uh, sample space. When we had the insurance company, although the number of claims we got was a finite integer, the space of possible outcomes was 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And so that space, that space was, was infinite. That space there. Uh, you may have learned about this somewhere else, or you may yet learn it in another course. But uh, infinite, it's an infinite thing, but we can count it. Right? It can't be one and a half or pi or e or something. It's like discrete countable things, even though there are infinitely many of them. And so when we have discrete, separate, countable things, that's known as countably infinite. I'm just bringing that up now because it will be important later on in the course, even though it doesn't matter at the moment. Whereas this set we had here of all the integers between 0 and 1, sorry, all the real numbers between 0 and 1, well, there are also an infinite number of numbers between 0 and 1. So that's infinite too. But unlike the insurance claims, where there were discrete separate integers that we could count up, here we like have a continual manage measurement. Like there isn't a step between the different numbers. It just continues. It goes backwards and forwards. We have a continuum, or we're measuring things rather than counting things. And so this is called uncountably infinite. Again, we don't need to know that about that now, but it might be useful later on in the course. So to put it another way, uh, the finite and the countably infinite things, uh, they were for counting, right? These were counting, whereas this uncountably infinite thing was more like measuring. Because the, the counting things had specific outcomes that were possible that were separated and discrete, whereas this measuring thing was continuous. And there was just, you know, you could turn the measurement up or down. Again, don't need to know about those now, but they'll be important later on in the course. There is one last thing I want to mention in this section. Uh, and that's about two events that you always have at any sample space. Uh, so for any sample space, omega, there's two special events we always have. One is the event that consists of nothing. 
that's a fu funny seeming set. Uh, it's called sometimes it's called the empty set. Sometimes given this symbol that's a bit like a zero, a circle with a line through it. So that's a set, but with nothing between the curly brackets, and that kind of represents that that nothing happens at all. You roll the dice and nothing happens. Or you toss the coin and nothing happens. It's a very strange event, but you know it satisfies all the rules you've set up. And similarly, you can have the whole space. Omega is an event in itself. And that's the kind of a, a something happens. Yeah. I toss the coin and I get a head or tail. I roll the dice and I get a one, two, three, four, five, or six. It feels like that the probability of this first thing ought to be zero, right? Ought to be. We'll later see more about this. And similarly, the probability that something happens that we get a head or a tail, well, we're bound to get a head or a tail, so it feels like the probability of this ought to be one. Probably that nothing happens ought to be zero, the probability that something happens ought to be one. So later on we'll see that the second of these, that the probability is one, is going to be one of our rules of probability, that's going to be part of our definition. Whereas the first one of these, the probability that nothing happens is zero, is going to be something that we prove follows from our definition. And so we'll read about that in section 2.4, which will be coming later.